his first time I think I presented. Is it Kenyan's first? Kenyan, well, you're familiar with Kenyan. First time I presented. So, what we do is kind of like a musical meditation. Um, and we'll sing the names of the divine. Yeah. Repeating this prayer, I believe that the mantra is part of it. So, the screen is part Yes. So, it's part of it. So, we have names of the divine, feminine and masculine. Um, Chanted in a group of one to connect. So, I'll let you experience it. It's much better than tomorrow to do it. So, we'll go for about 20 minutes.
Once again, thank you all for coming. So we have our very dear friend, our local teacher here. His name is Go Duma. Say, Go Duma. Go Duma. <laughs> and uh, he's he's been a local here in New York City and helping with the Bhakti Center. He's uh, really appreciated for his wonderful presentations. Very thoughtful. Today's subject is karma. Everyone give them a nice welcome.
So welcome. Yeah. This is our weekly soft talks program. We go on to one. Mm -hmm. uh, well, 40. So discussion ends at 40. And then after that is the lunch for 40. So yeah, today's uh, topic is karma. I may have to adjust my presentation a bit. So anybody not familiar with karma? Or rather, let me just ask, what is your idea of karma? What does it mean to you? By the way, this is an interactive discussion in this group, so the participation side of the issue. Anyone? Um, I don't Yes, nice definition. You said karma is action. You said everybody has karma. That's a nice point you mentioned. Any other thoughts? What is karma? What does karma mean to you? What is your understanding of karma? Yeah, what's your name? I'm Ellie. So I don't want to define it, but I think it's important, especially because I don't know too much about it. It's a bit difficult, but um, you know, the point was made that everyone carries karma, and I think of karma as to be um, non-linear. So it's not exactly like a start and point. I think it's something that we carry. And I personally believe in reincarnation, so I think our lives carry it. So it's an amalgamation of this thing. Really? Thank you. You said karma is not linear, and then you said uh, it's spatial. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. It's a nice way to understand karma. Any other thoughts? Or what is it? it? Doesn't have to be right or wrong. It's just your understanding. Yes. I think the most uh, common response that I get to this question is what goes around comes around. Yeah, that's the <laughs> sweet definition. <laughs> the most easiest way to understand what goes around comes around. So uh, you see, every society. Every uh, culture, there's some understanding of karma. You may not call it karma, but the idea that whatever you put out there comes back to you, or the, at least the idea of doing good to others. It's you have a, some sort of a belief, a deep belief within that it's nice to be nice to others. It's good to be. You're never taught in society's cultures or any kind of schools of wanting to intentionally do bad to others. So there's this understanding that whatever you put out there comes back. Was even parents when they're teaching their kids. No, none of you won't see any parents teaching their kids to sort of be vengeful and, and so on. You always see instructions being given on being nice to others. And why is it so important? You know, there wasn't this idea of something coming, our actions sort of, you know, as, as I think in the Bible it says, you so as you shall. So if that basic understanding wasn't there, then you're free to act. The way we want to, but the fact that there is some consequence for action makes us a little more thoughtful. So, in every tradition is there, and most people believe it. Some might not believe, but at least for the, for the most part, people have this understanding that it's nice to be good to others because you know, I might be at the receiving end of what I'm putting out there. So, it's really natural, and it just uh, it's natural to humans to understand that. There's something, whether we call it karma or not. Let's see. Uh, our 
most governments, most societies have a law enforcement system, right? Where you sort of your actions have, especially your negative actions, have certain consequences. There's you know cops and, and there's laws and, and fines and tickets and parking, whatever that is. There's there's like a law enforcement system which makes sure that our actions are within the a framework of accepted human behavior. Now, many times we may act in such a way that we are not sort of uh, bound by the law enforcement system, but we can get away with acting in such a, in an unfavorable way. Can you think of any situations like that? For example, you can hurt someone, or you can act in certain ways where you're not bound by the law enforcement system. Is everybody following me? Like war? What's that? I think war. War, you said? Yeah. Just things like you're not obligated legally. You know, you can cheat on your partner or whatever, you know, just like you're not obligated legally in a legal sense. You know? Of course, you can sue people, but if I'm being mean to someone, I mean, it's hard to sort of prove that in, in court, you know. So we can get, to some extent, we can get away with acting in such a way that you're not obligated legally. But the universe has its own law enforcement system. And nobody can get away from that universal law enforcement system. And that is what we call as karma. So every action has a certain reaction, and nobody can run away from it. And karma can be good and bad. So whatever actions we perform, like for Esther, like you were saying, is one way of defining karma as work or action. So our action, every action has a certain consequences. So the interesting thing is who implements this? Who implements this universal law enforcement system? Is there someone who's sort of watching like a cop, universal police, law enforcement system? Who runs the whole show? Can you see your karma? Like you both mentioned being happy, everybody has a karma. Can you see your own karma and the karma of others? How does it look? And how much? Imagine if you could see your karmic account, like a karmic bank account with this much I have in my savings and this much I owe. So it'd be so fascinating that I should see, look into our karmic bank account, so to speak. So the ancient bhakti tradition gives us more insight to how, who runs the show and how does it all work. But before that, we can sort of define karma if you look into a more like a etymological, Sanskrit etymological way of defining karma. Karma, it comes from the Sanskrit root kri. And there's a lot of words that come from this root. One of the words that come is the Kriya. Practice right? Kriya, you got Kriya. Kriya also means action. So this Kriya, Karma, truth, all these words come from the root Kri. And the basic meaning of the word, the root, is to do or to generate or to basically do action. So Karma comes from that, from the Sanskrit root. And as some of you mentioned, there's few ways to define Karma. Karma is one of those Sanskrit words which doesn't have one single definition. Depending on the context, how even in English you can use a word, and depending on the context, the word can have different meanings. Like um, balance, for example. Balance can mean, depending on the context, I'm like balancing on a bicycle, or balance can also mean your balance in a bank account. So like the karma also has different meaning, different uh, ways of defining karma. So one way you can, these are the different ways. The first way is like action, as, as you define as like action and work, that's also karma. Simply doing anything, that's karma. Second is the most common way of understanding is like the reaction we get, right? Karma. The third way of defining karma is good action, not just action, but good action. There's a verse in Bhagavad Gita where karma is used in the, the, the meaning of the karma in that verse is good actions, nice, Deeds. The fourth way of defining karma is prescribed beauty. This is a complicated term which comes up in Bhagavad Gita. This theme is a complicated theme which comes up in the book Bhagavad Gita. Prescribed beauties, which things that you're obligated to do, like society, like things, like for example, family, you have your certain sort of obligations towards your children, your parents, and so on. And those are known as prescribed beauties. And the fifth way of defining karma is a whole system of action and reaction like the law enforcement system. And these are the different ways of defining karma. Uh, does any one of these sort of resonate with you more? Is that, or 
is a match up with your understanding. And like I said, this is not so much a piece of monologue. You would be jumping within thoughts or anything. So no matter what our understanding, did you want to share? Um, well, it's action, you said. Action. Yeah. Work. Yeah, action or any kind of like the action. It's calm. It's calm. Yeah. yeah. It literally means like act. Yeah. If I do something wrong, something bad will happen to me back. Yeah. In other words. Yeah. The energy of the universe. Right. But who runs the show, like you said? Yeah. So we'll dig into that as, as the discussion goes on. Like even. Like Newton's one of Newton's laws was a reaction is an equal and opposite reaction. So the scientists sort of understood that we have some sort of a, 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 a balancing force which, which accompanies our actions. So uh, that's, again, that's one of the definitions of karma. But for this discussion, we look at more at the first definition of action and also reaction. And the whole system of action and reaction. Also, we won't get into the prescribed duties. That's a whole other discussion in and of itself. Yeah. What's the difference between the first and the second? That's a that's a good question because they seem similar, right? So the first way of defining karma is just action. That's it. Like you have, like for example, in English, you might say you have to act in the situation or you have to do. You have to work. So that's just karma. That's it. it. Doesn't have any connotation of reaction and things like that. It just simply means to act. You know, your daily activities, how are you going to act in the situation? You're on a stage, you have to sort of act, or whatever that is. That's just action to do work. Does that make sense? And then the, the last definition is a whole system of action and reaction. Like, what's your name? Joanna. Joanna. And what's your name? Diane. Diane. What is Joanna and Diane. <laughs> so, uh, like you were asking, like who runs it, right? That's the fifth way of sort of definition of karma, of the whole system. Like we were saying, the law enforcement system, the legal system, like that. The karma, one way of defining karma is the universal law enforcement system. So, these are the different ways of defining uh, karma. And, like we were saying, that karma is like a set like of credit history, depending on your financial transactions. Uh, if you're responsible in your financial dealings, you get a good credit score. And if you're not really responsible financially, you get a bad credit score, right? So that's your credit karma. A lot of, this word karma is like a buzzword we use in many colloquial contemporary settings, credit karma, things like that. So like that, we, we also have a karmic credit. You know? So if you act good, your credit, karmic credit score is good. If you act bad, your karmic credit score is, is not that good. And uh, if your financial credit is good, then that means you have more spending power, right? You're more accepted by banks and you're more spending power. And if your credit score is bad, then you might not have a little leeway in terms of spending. You don't have much freedom. Like that, even in karma, if you have a good karma, you have more leeway, more room to sort of work with. If you have bad karma, you're sort of really confined in, in how you can act. And let's say, for example, in a more rural setting, like a farm setting, if you have cattle which is tied to a pole, right? To the rope. Then the rope is short, the cattle, the, the cow or whatever, they can just go in a certain diameter, like a radius, you know. If the rope is short, then it can just go around that sort of radius. And if the animal has been behaving good, the cow or whatever, the the farmer may sort of lengthen the rope. Now the, the, the radius also increases, so the, the animal has a bigger sort of circumference to sort of navigate. But like that, if we, if we act good, our rope, so, so to speak, is sort of lengthened and we have more room to sort of act. And conversely, if we not acting in a good way, the rope is shortened and we have little leeway in terms. And if, if the animal is really good, then the rope might altogether be sort of released. The, the, the animals sort of free to move about. So that is how karma also works, depending on how we act. Our rope, karmic rope is either shortened or lengthened or just all together, you know, to be free. So in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also defines like 
the necessity to understand karma, why is karma important? And he defines three ways of acting in Bhagavad Gita. And he says, Karma no hi apiri bodhavyam, bodhavyam cha vikamana, this is an Asian language called Sanskrit, akarmana cha bodhavyam, gahana karma no He says, that the intricacies of action are very hard to understand. Therefore, one should know properly what action is, what forbidden action is, and what sinful action is. Or in simple terms, Sanskrit is known as vikarma, karma, and avarama. So here we see again the word karma coming up. So here karma means good action. And vikarma is like sinful action. So now this word sin can have like a negative connotation of sin, you're a sinner. Yeah. And again, have come with the baggage, like nobody likes to use the word sin, right? But in the bhakti tradition, all sin means that, see, for example, every action can have a consequence, right? So all sin means is any action which has an unfavorable reaction. For example, you might sort of eat some old food which is like infected, and uh, now that produces a reaction, right? It's not so much as used in a judgmental way, but it just all it means is any action that you do is not producing favorable reaction. So vikarma is those actions which are not necessarily good for you or others. That is vikarma. Vikarma are those actions which are which produces a good result. And palkarma, which we talk about at the end, are spiritual activities which actually, believe it or not, doesn't produce any karma. So those are spiritual activities. So we'll talk again at the end, if time permits. So like this, uh, we see that one has to understand what category our actions fall into. So this makes us more conscientious in how we act, how we deal with others. Let's say, for example, you may yell at someone on the phone and slam the phone. And you may not be legally bound or implicated, legally speaking. But if one understands that, okay, this action, I may be at the receiving end, that's, that's the kind of such action which either hurt others or produce, produce a not so favorable reaction to us, that is the karma. So that helps to understand, for us to understand how uh, our actions produce reaction. And it is said that every action we do, sometimes we may act in such a way that nobody sees it. You know, you can, you can, you can get away with it. It's not that bad. You know, sometimes you, whatever, there's like a, there's a cookie, you don't know, you know, like in, in our bhakti tradition, food is like a big aspect, and you may take away someone's plate or a cookie, and you see nobody saw, you know, and I can sort of do it and get away with it. And I don't know if you've had some situations where you feel, you know, as long as you can get away with it, it's not, it's not a bad thing to do. So it said that there is uh, the, the universal law enforcement agents of karma, Yamaraj and his assistants are known as Yamadutas, and one of them is Chitra Gupta. And Sanskrit word Chitra means a photograph. And the Gupta, Gupta means hidden. So Chitra Gupta, his job is anytime you do something, click, snapshot. <laughs> he, he records all of this. When you stole that cookie, you were not supposed to click. Or, you know, you said something really nasty, click. Or you or push someone the stairs in the subway or you just hustle or whatever that is, click. All those things you think that nobody's watching us, it's all being recorded. And all of this is actually what produces the snapshot. So Chitra Gupta, his job is to actually take an inventory of every single thing we do. So nobody sort of escapes the system of karma, which all comes back in some shape or form sooner or later. And it's said that karma is so it's so intricate in the way it comes and catches up with you is the example in the Bhakti tradition, the example given is just like a, a mother cow can find her calf among millions of other calves, automatically they'll find each other, the calf and the mother. Like that, your karma will come and find you. You may do something and run away, go to another city, you may commit a crime, just escape and go to another country, just your safety hiding. Okay, now I'm free. Nobody saw that. And nobody can come catch me. But it said that the karma will come find you. Nobody can escape from your karma. That is how intricate it is. And it's also said that uh, actually, yes, yeah, so this is what I was talking about, three types of karma. The karma, karma, and our karma. So the karma is those actions that produce unfavorable results. 
And one of those actions which produce unfavorable reaction is, is harming other, other living agencies, especially animals. Like for example, in human, harming other humans is no brainer, right? Everybody knows that if you're harming, physically harming other, another human, the law enforcement system will be on your, on this, I mean, on you basically. But what about harming animals? So it said that even uh, causing harm to animals, killing animals also is considered growing a lot of bad karma. You know, if you're either torturing animals, killing animals, or whatever that is, that also produces reaction. And the ancient yoga text says that actually, if you sort of harm or kill a particular animal, then your karma is to be killed by that same animal. So let's say, for example, you, in an extreme sense, you kill a cow or whatever animal or a fish with fishing and you sort of kill an animal, right? It said that your karma is that you take the form of that particular animal, either like a fish, and that fish that you kill will take the form of a human and the same action will now be, except that that fish now takes a human form and will actually do the same thing to you which you did on that animal. So that's how complex laws of karma is. And not just that. Let's say, for example, now you are, you have to develop certain sufficient karma for you to take a form of a fish or a cow. That may happen in a hundred lifetimes. It may not be right away. So a hundred lifetimes later, you need to take a form of a fish. And that fish also has to take a human form. So when these two events coincide, imagine how many millions of years that would be. When this, these two events match, that's when that particular karma gets fructified. So that's why karma is really complex. It's really hard to understand. And many people sort of, they try to understand and they can't wrap their minds around it and then they just give up. It's just too complex. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it doesn't make sense. I think the other thing is that, that people, because people don't see it necessarily in this lifetime, you know, in the sense of this, that things are unfair, that people who do bad things get away with things because um, because I don't see them somehow getting the reaction to this lifetime. Yeah, that's such a nice point. Like, there's this word instant karma, right? Have you heard that? There's been YouTube videos of instant karma. Someone does it right away, they get a pullback, you know? So that's such a nice point. Just because something doesn't happen instantly, you do something way around. Okay, someone's going to smack me now. You just look around, nothing happened. Okay, maybe I can get away with it. So, uh, and the reason why some certain actions can produce instant reactions and certain actions can take time for it to fructify. Like we discussed in this example, how for that, there's certain events have to be fulfilled for that action to be fructified. And animals also feel pain. Any pet owners here? What kind of pet do you have? A cat. Cat? No. No. <laughs> Both. So you see, especially with dogs, they express emotions. You know, you're crying. So do cats. Huh? So do cats. cats also, you know, I've had dogs, but I know about dogs, but cats also. Yeah. Have. You know, if you accidentally step on their toe, you know, they squeal or they're like, you know, they'll cry out. Or, yeah. you know, and think of something, I'm not going to mention, but something like harmful, which, you know, you try to sort of inflict pain in your uh, pet, like a dog, they, they react. Have you ever seen a dog or a cat you poke them with a needle and they just say it's tough? They'll react, they, they feel pain. So it's so arrogant for humans to think that animals are just meant for my happiness, my consumption, it's not free. They're at my disposal and I can just go ahead and uh, like I'll, I love going to Central Park and there's a beautiful lake, there's like ducks, there's turtle. And a lot of times there are people fishing. And once I was there and someone was they would put their sort of fishing rod and then they caught a fish. And I was watching, the fish was like trembling and, and, and shivering in pain as they were sort of rolling their fishing hook and then they put it in their basket and the fish was just sort of jumping up and down, trembling. And I couldn't watch that, I just walked away. It was just really sad to see that. Yeah. So animals also, animals feel pain. Not only animals, all living entities you know, feel pain. So you might wonder that, okay, what is the idea of karma? Why is it? Why is there a system like that? Mm -hmm. Any, if you wonder, what is the deeper idea of karma? Is it simply just, you know, you do something bad, you get something bad, is that it? Is that the whole idea? Is it, or is there something deeper? Mm -hmm. Oh. 
religious to be absorbed in the new bhakti dimension. So Kala brought brought him to Buddha. So he was a prince, but in a way he left his family and his school and his country to start his explorations and and then finally the about found a small Buddhism. So like distance himself from his described beauty or his original life course. Yeah. I don't know what's good at that. And I, I was trying to think when if I was his father or his family. And then it's not in my idea that they're difficult to accept at the moment for me to. But uh, in the end, he, he created he create his life in a profound way. Thank you. Thank you for the collective karma. When is it collective karma? I thought that uh, you mentioned about God and Buddha also. And he saw the suffering he was a prince in eastern India like thousands of years ago. And uh, he decided, as kings usually do, sometimes they step out outside of their palace in Gavino just to sort of inspect the citizens to see how they're doing. And when he stepped outside, he saw people suffering at the collective karma you're saying. He was really moved by that. And that led to his enlightenment. So karma also, you might think, okay, what is the whole idea of karma? Why is there is it, is it all about punishing someone? Like someone is getting a lot of pleasure or doing something bad, like, ah, ha, ha, I'm going to torture you to death. Or, you know, whatever that is, that the whole idea of karma? Actually, the whole idea of karma is it helps in evolution of human consciousness. The whole reason why karma is placed is for us to understand that Human life means one has to be aware that our actions have certain consequences. So when we truly, by karma, we understand other people's pain and suffering. Like imagine if you've never felt pain, how would you know what pain is when someone else goes through it? How would you ever know? That's what actually narcissists are. For narcissists, it's so hard to feel empathetic because they, they just can't feel people's pain. They might intellectually know it. Let's say the narcissist is putting you through a lot of physical pain or whatever pain. They might intellectually know it, that person is feeling pain, but they don't know what it means. That's why it's so hard for them to connect with others, emotionally speaking. So karma is only when we feel pain. Like, for example, you've never felt a pin prick in your whole life. You just don't know what it means. When you're watching someone feeling a prick, you wouldn't understand what that means. You're just looking at someone and you're like, yeah, thank you. But you know what a pain prick is, how painful it is. And then you see someone and you feel, okay, I can understand that. So karma is meant to help in evolution of our consciousness. Our consciousness can sometimes be at a, at a base level. So by, uh, by the system of karma, even scientists actually have come up with this studies of operant conditioning. Does anybody know what operant conditioning is? So basically operant conditioning is like an experiment uh, by Pablo, Pablo's experiment, that right, where he does these studies on dogs, especially. So what he does is, every time he's about to feed his dogs, he rings a bell and then he feeds them. And he keeps doing this. He'll ring a bell and then he'll feed them. And over time, he noticed that the dogs they learn to sort of link the two events together: mm -hmm. the ringing of the bell and then feeding. So as soon as he would ring the bell, they would start sal salivating. So even if he's not feeding them food, he'll ring the bell and they will start salivating. So he noticed that it's called operant conditioning. So one is sort of conditioned in a certain way by previous experience. So when you repeatedly have a consequence for a certain reaction, one becomes conditioned to act in a good way. It's called as a system of reward and punishment. So the more colloquial way of defining operant conditioning is this conditioning of reward and punishment. So Reward and punishment meaning you train someone, like especially the dogs, the way you train them is you do something, you reward them. And they don't do something good, you sort of punish them. So by this reward and punishment system, one learns to act in good ways. If I act in a good way, I'm going to be rewarded. If I act in a bad way, then 
then there's a negative consequence. So it starts at base level and by continuing to add this where consciousness gradually uh, evolves. Because sometimes what happens is we might act with good intentions, not necessarily considering the consequence. Has that happened to you ever that you, you know, I thought I was acting, I was being good, you know, the reaction is not that bad. And uh, the consequence is not necessarily good, but it's not simply important just to have good intentions. You may do something and say, well, it's not my fault. I have good intentions in mind. Now, would that reasoning work in court? You know, it wasn't a good intention. I felt something bad and that person died. It was, it's not my fault. It wasn't a good intention. So it's not just intention. It's also the consequence of that action. So like it's said, the, the road to hell is paid with good intentions. Have you heard that? See? The road to hell is paid with good intentions. So intentions are good. But one also has to go beyond that and also think about the consequence. My action right now is going to bear good consequence or not? And that's when we become a little more involved. And you might say, yeah, that's a no-brainer, you know, you deal, like everybody does it. But it's not as simple as it seems, you know, especially relationships, whatever we do things, or especially a lot of young people we get into relationships. And sometimes for better or worse, there's a lot of teenage pregnancies and like a lot of kids act impulsively and always my good intention. You know, recently one of my friends that I'm sort of, he's not a teenager, he's like older than me. And I was sort of guiding him in a certain way in that relationship. And I was trying to right from the right off the bat, I was saying, I don't see this sort of ending really well, and he kept acting in a certain way, the reaction, that the consequence wasn't necessarily good. And he kept saying from the beginning, look, look, it's my, I'm acting out of good intention. I only have good feelings for her. And so it might seem really simple, like, yeah, yeah, you know, our consequences are also important. But it's not that simple. So intentions and consequences, we have to consider both of these when we act. And that is what karma teaches us. With a quick stop right here. Any thoughts on that so far? Anything that either doesn't resonate with you or anything that you can sort of reflect uh, in your past that sort of resonates with you. You're <laughs> smiling. Is... Well, while well, you're talking about past, I was thinking like I can't identify myself as the best. You can't. I you I, I should not. And so to, since, since we are the, the creator and the creation of ourselves, it's like here now, what is happening? Yeah, if I have the courage to, to step out of the closer or the Functioning in that way. Wonderful. folks, so if I understand it correctly, we don't want to be defined only by our past, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a nice way to think that now is what we have. But that's such a nice point because sometimes it's easy to get the victim mentality, mm -hmm. whatever our past is, and we the reaction for that. It's easy to get the victim mentality or a resigned, fatalistic mindset of being too caught up in the past. So it's nice to sort of take responsibility for the present and think that I am the, the creator of my own reaction. That's a, thank you for that. It's a beautiful reflection. Yes. What about our thoughts? Mm. So Is that karma as well? I mean, you, could, you know, we all have different thoughts and some of them are bad. Excellent. So the consciousness of uh, what's going on in the brain. Beautiful, wonderful question. So again, in the Bhakti tradition talks about time in terms of different ages. 
So it's in the bygone ages, even our thoughts have um, visible manifest karma reaction. But in our current age, it's said that this, this age is called Kali Yuga, just like in Western history, we have like Ice Age, Bronze Age, uh, what, like Stone, Stone Age, Bronze Age, and different ages we have. This is the you know, Iron Age. So in the but the tradition also defines four ages. And in this age, it says that our, we are exempt from our thoughts in terms of having a visible manifest karma, but still our thoughts, negative thoughts, do have some kind of a ruling effect in our, in our consciousness. So you may not necessarily have a, a, a visible manifest reaction from that, but by harboring negative thoughts, it does lead to a polluted consciousness. And the thing is, sooner or later, that polluted consciousness will manifest into action, and that action will then produce reactions. Yes, brother. That's that. <laughs> 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 you to it. <laughs> um, and yeah. Going back to the story of the fisherman and the fish, mm -hmm. that um, we go out and we are fishing, and we find this fish, we catch this fish, and at some point, in the life will coincide, right? And now the fish will take the form of a human and you will, you know, I guess almost like fate, you go through that same experience from this fish's perspective. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that, it's not as clear cut as that, right? Because then that would just perpetuate the cycle that the fish is not human and it's doing the same deed, right? So is it, is it, um, say that the person who, who does the, the action, the bad action, to experience the same thing that he or she had to still have something else, but not necessarily the recipient is what I'm asking. Is that, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so I'll respond to let me know if I answer it as per your question. That it's literally karma is really specific. Karma is not a big thing or like it's balanced out as it's really specific. Uh, so from my understanding, it's the exact situation needs to happen. And you might wonder what are the odds of that happening? And that's why the system is so entangling. It's so, uh, as you see, it's so complex because till the time that happens, imagine how much more karma you're doing, how many more fishes or animals you've, or humans you've hurt, and all of that. So it's like countless. But the next question you might have is then, is there a way to get out of it? And I'm extending you, I don't know if you have that question, but I'm extending you. Yes, in regards to the situation, that's part of what I was asking, but also um, the same situation will happen. Mm -hmm. The same parties will be involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then my follow-up question would be that, which you just specified. So we we'll, we'll, if you can hold this question, okay. this will be answered, then what do you, because if we simply sit around and just say, okay, you know, karma, and then this is what it is, and what is the solution, you know, what is, how do you get? Get out of it. Yes. I just wanted to say that, uh, like some, I think, you know, I, something I hadn't uh, remembered asking, I had not remembered doing this time. What's the point? What's the benefit of suffering something? And uh, one thing that you'll see is, like in, in social experiments, where they like, they had this one in New York City where they had this 13 year old kid standing up in the pole uh, with a sign that said, Please help. And it was like uh, 12 degrees out, and he just had a t shirt and jeans. It was actually called the kid, it was just an experiment. And so many people walked by, except for that person who felt the pinprick. I mean, as you said, that someone who was homeless and that had experienced that type of suffering immediately came and offered his own coat. And it, it could be by chance that in his past life, he was like a Scrooge. He was the Ebenezer. And if you don't, if you don't learn that lesson, if your parents telling you, don't be greedy, if you don't learn that lesson from some religious tradition or school or whatever, then the school of heart knocks, teaches that lesson, and you actually become transformed by it. It's not like a punishment. It's, it's not punitive, it's transformative. But you actually, like the, the, the Person who experiences that suffering automatically becomes more of it, it's transformed, not just of it, just uh, baseless suffering. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's such a nice uh, point. You might not remember, but still, the effect is it, it helps us develop that empathy uh, and it trains us basically. It's like a cosmic sensitivity training, as I like to call it. Karma is a cosmic sensitivity training. It helps us be more sensitive. And this kind of explains why some people are born rich, some people are born poor, handsome, ugly, beautiful, so on and so forth. So karma is such a nice detailed uh, account or explanation of different aspects. Because if you don't sort of consider karma, then how do you explain all of these things? I explain all these phenomena that happen. This is just random. Some people are just randomly blessed with this, and some people are randomly cursed. How do you explain all of this? So without karma, it can be really uh, hard to explain. And it's also said that by our actions, our, that also means that our current actions are also laying the, the bricks for our future role. They're laying the foundation for your future, for your, and that's also, you may call it destiny, you may call it whatever that is. By your current action, you're, you're laying out your future foundation. So your current situation, in case you love or hate it, your current situation is actually created by you, as Esther was saying, that I'm a creator of my action. So for example, your bodies, right? Just take a moment to look at your bodies. This body that you have, you actually ordered it. This is your custom order. You ordered these bodies by your past. So whether you like it or you hate it, you basically chose to sort of, by your past actions, you created this. So karma is such, it works in such a way that it, you're creating your future foundation. That also means your future life, your birth, everything, your situation. So we created the situation <coughs> and that nobody else to blame than us. So this way we see life is not unfair. It's not just random. That things just randomly happen. And to further give, I'll give one story of how karma is really like intricate. It works in a really intricate way. So one of the ancient stories talks about this bird, Garuda, he was once flying with this bird and he saw a beautiful, like a, a beautiful little bird, a really small bird, and he was watching that bird and appreciation how beautiful this bird is. And by then, this grim reaper, as we may say, the agent of death, just shows up, Rama Yama shows up on the scene. And he's looking at the bird, and it, it is said that the agent of death, if he looks at someone, that's, that means it's, it's, it's time's up. A bad sign if the agent of death appears and looks at you, then your time has come to take you. Death is awaiting. So, this bird, bigger bird, Garuda, is really overcome with compassion. Like, oh, oh no, it's, that's it. It's the end of life for this bird. It's, the reaper's gonna come take him away. So, what this bird, this bigger bird, does is he grabs this little bird and flies thousands of miles, really flies real fast and drops the bird somewhere else and then comes back. And in the meantime, the Reaper, Yamara, he goes away. And this big Garuda, he comes back. And then after some time, this Yamaraj comes back again. And then Garuda asks Yamaraj, this bird asks Reaper, why did you look at the bird? What, what was going on? And why were you so confused? Because the Reaper, he was really confused when he saw that bird. He's like scratching his head and he's looking at the bird. And he's, so this Yam Garuda asks, Yamaraj, why were you so confused when you looked at the bird? So Yamaraj said that actually the destiny of this bird was to die thousands of miles away by another, you know, by another agent. And he was wondering, like, what is this bird doing here? He's supposed to die thousands of miles away. And that's why I was so confused. And what this Gurma did was he, he took this bird and met, he introduced him to the agent of his death. So you see, you follow the story that the, the destiny of the bird was to die thousands of miles away because Garuda was just acted as an instrument of his karma. So no matter how or how like how the situation unfolds, we are simply an instrument of our karma. Karma just happens no matter what. You can't adjust it no matter where you go, how you try to run away from that situation. Karma always happens. And another question that comes up is. You know, I'm always okay. I understand my past bad actions create bad reactions, but I'm always been good. My grandma is suffering, she's always been a good lady. You know, why are bad things happening? Has anybody had that question? Like, she's always acting good. You know, why is bad things happening to her? So, there's a nice, like, a, a example of like 
grain of silos. It's you see this in whole foods a lot, right? Let's say you feed bad grains first or bad granola, whatever that is. You first keep feeding bad granola. And then after some point, if you feed good grains on the top, and then when you dispense it at the bottom, what's going to come? Bad grains or good grains? Because you, but you're still feeding good grains. Why are you getting bad grains first? Because that's what you're first, like first, right? So sometimes we are suffering and say, oh, I'm always acting good. Why am I suffering? That's because behind your good actions is your karma waiting, the bad actions that are first waiting to rectify. So like this, we see that uh, karma is actually really, like you said, it's not linear, it's not really, it, it, it's really complex. In this way, so do we have a few more minutes? We're going? Okay. okay, so I, I'll give you one story, another story, and a video, sort of, if anybody's, in case anybody's asleep to wake you up. So there's a nice story of uh, how to further elaborate how complex karma is. It's not really straightforward. Like you do something bad and then it does this. Like a, like a whatever, like the head. You do something bad and someone smacks you in the head. You, it's not something like an instant reaction. So in one of the ancient texts from Mahabharata, there is this king, you see, who's like a blind king, and then the Trashtra. And he's asking Krishna, the divine, so the, this king, Drashtra, was a king, which means that he had a good karma. He was born in opulence, like money, riches, king, of course, you know, you know king lives a comfortable life. But then he was born blind. That's so strange. And then on the other side, he desired a lot of children. And uh, he got wonderful kids, like 100 of them, actually. Or, uh, 100 so. so in really text, it's explained that to have kids, you have to be blessed accordingly. But then, as, as fate would have it, there was an ancient battle, and all of those hundred sons, they died in that battle. And not only did they die, but they died in his presence, not after he. Usually the father, parents, they die in their kids. Fathers outlive their, usually, generally the parents outlive their children. But in this case, in his presence, his hundred sons died. So he's really confused. Wait, do I have good karma or do I have bad karma? On one side, I was born rich, came to karma, but then I was born blind, bad karma. I had beautiful hundred sons, good karma, but then they died in my presence, bad karma. What is going on? So he has Krishna, divine. Can you tell me what is what, what sort of karma do I have? So Krishna said that actually 50 lifetimes ago, you were a hunter, and your specific style of hunting was. There was a tree, and in the tree there was a nest with like about 100 birdlings or whatever you want to call them, chicks, baby birds, yeah, baby birds. And the father of the bird actually left to sort of fetch some food. And what you did was you took your bow and arrow and you set your arrow on fire and you shot the tree and you set the whole tree on fire. And when the father bird came back, he saw his 100 baby birds burn and die in front of his own eyes. And he was so pain, the bird was like chirping and trying to somehow save, but he couldn't do anything. And then bird cursed that just like you made me witness the death of my 100 offsprings, you will actually go through the same uh, uh, sort of karma. So his karma was to sort of see, uh, so his karma was to get 100 sons and they were meant to die in a battle. But now the thing is, you first have to accrue good karma for him to be born as a king. And also to have 100 sons who are like kings. So that couldn't happen until 50 lifetimes. So he had to first take birth, do good karma for 50 lifetimes. And after 50 lifetimes, when he has sufficient good karma, then that event rectified. Now he was born as a king and uh, he was born blind and so on. So you see, uh, your karma needs sufficient time to fructify, just like an investment or you sow like a, a plant. When you sow a seed, it doesn't right away fructify. It takes a while, like a year or so, and then it goes into a big tree. So like that, Krishna said, it took you time for your karma to fructify. Now here you are, you have mixed karma, good karma. So that is how complex karma is. 
And further, the Bhakti text is, explains I'll go real fast. We have just a few minutes, and maybe during lunch we can talk more about this. So it, it talks about the cycle of karma, how it goes on in the cycle. So it says it starts with ignorance. And again, here ignorance is not necessarily meant in a judgmental way. Ignorance, but ignorance it means lack of proper understanding, lack of spiritual enlightenment. So it starts with this cycle of uh, with this lack of spiritual understanding. And that leads to something called as bija, or bija literally means a seed, sinful desire, a seed of a sinful desire. So that sinful desire is sown in our heart. And when that desire sort of manifests, Manifest sufficient. For example, let's say you want to do something bad. You first get thoughts of doing something, right? Either an addiction or whatever that is. So there's a desire. You get thoughts at first. You're thinking, okay, I'm not going to act. And the thought goes in circles and circles. And when it gains sufficient momentum, it then uh, transforms into action. And then you commit that particular action. So that is problem. But that sinful, or let's say that unfavorable desire manifests into action, that is problem. So when you do that act, then that action produces a reaction. So that reaction is known as, it's first up rather than that reaction which is not completely manifest. So that explains why sometimes you act and you don't see a reaction, right? You slap someone or you push someone and you walk away and nothing happened. You got away with it. You know, nobody came, nobody chased you. You were getting a reaction, but it's in an unmanifest state. So that is a part of the reaction. So now this upper of the reaction, unmanifest reaction, can take two directions from this point. One direction is when the time is right, that unmanifest reaction then manifests. For example, someone was chasing a few blocks, you can see it. You kick someone and you walked away. And you thought, ah, I got away with it. And 10 blocks down the lane, someone caught up with you. And then they sort of, you know, pick a fight with you or whatever that is. So that is a manifest reaction. Now your karma is caught up. The other direction it could go is it's some, some portion of your karma doesn't fully fructify and manifest, but it lays dormant in your heart. That is known as kutam. It, lays, it creates more inclination to do the same thing. For example, drugs or sex or whatever that is. Let's say, for example, you, you, you want to smoke or do drugs. First is the desire comes in your heart. And when the desire is sufficiently strong, then it manifests in the reaction, which is pop up. Then you do that action, you know, you engage in some kind of you know, I don't know, prostitution, drugs, or whatever that is, you know, you do, you do that. That is the action itself is pop up. And then from that pop up, let's say, for example, prostitution, you know, or what I'm just using an example of prostitution. Now there is manifest, unmanifest reaction. Let's say you're supposed to get an STD or something like that. Now, right away, you might not see the, the reaction of that, right? You, and then you see, okay, I got away with it. Perfect. You know, nobody saw it. And then maybe six months later, you're developing some kind of an STD and you're not diagnosed. When it manifests, that is the prior of the reaction. So the time between prior of the and prior of the incubation period, just like if you see the state incubation period. And the other thing is, it creates this disposition to do more of that. Now you develop more of a desire to do that. You're going into substance abuse. If you do it once, you want to do it again and again. You know, heroin, okay, whatever that is. You want to do more of that. That is putam. That creates more of a, a push, like a push to do the same action. Even if you know it's not a good, it's not a good thing. Something within keeps pushing you to do something. And that again creates more desire and it goes in cycle again and again. So with this, maybe um since we don't have time, I'll play a short video. And then after that video, maybe we can take a few minutes of reflection. Is that okay? We can take, I'll play a video. After that video, we can take some reflections to see what your thoughts are. And then after that, we can have our lunch. So let's hope I can play this video. Um, okay. Thank you. 
That's the end of our presentation. Any final thoughts, reflection on maybe this video? Was any thoughts, especially for those who haven't spoken yet? Or anybody? Yeah. I, I love what you guys discussed, like how to identify your work on the pandemic. Oh, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Because of short of time, I couldn't get in that aspect. But thank you so much for reminding me. That's actually the most important. <laughs> part of the discussion is uh, what to do about it, right? So initially we discussed about three kinds of action, vikarma, karma, and karma. Vikarma is like unfavorable actions, karma is good actions. And good action also binds us, believe it or not. So just by acting good, that's not the end of the cycle. We continue our cycle. So karma are those spiritual activities that generate no result. And especially in that Akka spiritual activity, the process of mantra meditation is the most, most important thing. And uh, the mantra we start with chanted at the beginning, remember you saw the mantra at the start of the presentation, this mantra. So what differs this process of mantra meditation is this mantra meditation is so powerful that it can erase your all fear of past karma. That is how significant this mantra meditation is. Because many forms of meditation are just simply aimed at inner peace and just still in our mind. That's good. Mantra meditation does that, but in addition, it also completely vanquishes all of your past karma. 
And it said that even chanting the name of Krishna once, it can completely cleanse all of your past karma. And I've seen so many practitioners in bhakti, they've come from different backgrounds and, you know, maybe there's substance abuse and things like that. And once they get into bhakti, it just, it looks so different. I don't know, Prajwani, I mean, it's been, you look at like, their photos, they're glowing like before and after, they just look completely different. That's because your karma is completely changed and it's cleansed. So I think that also touches upon the, something you hinted at, right? And what do you do about that? So the process of mantra meditation, especially completely removes us from this cycle. It's never, I think the cycle is never ending. You see, in one lifetime, you have so many reactions. And for one of those reactions, you have to again go through many lifetimes. And that many lifetimes, you again have to many, many reactions. And one of those reactions is just, you know, exponential in math, there's something known as exponential. When you sort of do an exponential to something, it's basically infinity. It just goes to this infinity loop. So it's unending, basically. So this process of karma, mantra meditation, in fact, it, in this presentation, if, if you forgot everything, but you just remember this one point, that chanting Hare Krishna can completely remove all of your past karma. And that's the best takeaway you can take from this. So this chant is mantra meditation. That's why we use mantra meditation at the beginning. We have wonderful programs on Tuesdays, it's the guided mantra meditation. So please come check us out. So that will be more information in this process of mantra meditation. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? What's your name? Andrea. Huh? Andrea. Andrea. And you? Ashley. Ashley. Andrea and Ashley. So, uh, any final thoughts? Um, I do not know much about Indian history, especially Krishna. I heard like when he was in the pits, he was giving that to Afterwards, he became like a great warrior general or politician, and his personality totally changed. So I just, I just curious, like the transformation happened because he practiced yoga. <laughs> so two things. I'll make it really short. First thing is we have wonderful books for you, which is one book is called Krishna, which is the whole story of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Please make sure you get it before you go. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful books, we have a library section upstairs. Many of them are on donation based, whatever you can give. It's the view of every the whole history of Krishna. Mm -hmm. And second thing is Krishna is not some like a yogi or a, a regular person who became perfect because of this practice. Krishna is the name of divine. It's not that he had to do a practice and then he became. He is divine, always divine. So it's not that he was imperfect and he became perfect. And that book will give you more information of his whole story. It's really nice. It's really beautiful stories. And uh, yeah, thank you for that, for that question. And everyone loved his naughtiness. It was yeah. actually a, it, it was. <laughs> so, okay, thank you so much. We'll talk more during our lunch. Thank you. Thank you.